Today we have with us Noisemaker in Chief <laughs> and um, one of the co hosts of multiple award winning podcasts. I said what I said. I'm a co founder of production company Salt and Truth and also a founding member of the feminist coalition Femco. None other than Jola, aka Joel. Hello. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, this is probably the most civil engagement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, our engagements are usually more, um, how would I call it, brosis, <laughs> more yes. fighty than this. Yes, I was thinking about it a few days ago. I was like, well, I've known Koyo for over a decade. Isn't that bizarre? That's a long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. How are you? What's going on in your life currently? I'm fine. I'm fine. I... I'm going through like a weird, I'm trying not to get um, frustrated with work and doing business in Nigeria and Mm. being part of the media landscape here, I think. I'm trying, so that's what's been happening recently. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff also happening. Podcast is doing really, really well. Um, My production company, we're rounding up our first project. Um, So there's good stuff happening, but at the same time, it's trying to keep your eyes fixed on what's going well and not like all the many, many things not that are going do man, do wrong. Man. Yes. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, speaking of the podcast, mm. um, what inspired it? Um, so let me also just say that the name, I said what I said, is very Jola <laughs> and it's very FK <laughs> it at is. the same time. It is. So, but what inspired the podcast? Um, so I'd wanted to do a podcast since just after I finished university. Um, which is not yet a decade ago. Nobody asked you that. Just but will be next year. <laughs> um, but when I finished university, I knew I wanted to do a podcast, but I, what I knew that I, what I definitely didn't want to do was do a podcast on my own. Mm. Kind of like just rambling on and on. Yeah. I didn't think it would be that. I didn't want to do a business podcast because I didn't know anything about business. I didn't want to do, I wanted to do a fun, like a really interesting podcast. And I knew that the only way it would work in the way I had envisioned this was if I had um, someone with me, a co-host. Yeah. So I was looking for someone that would be on my vibe, that would be interested. And I kind of dropped the idea for a while, for like a year and a half or something. And then I moved back to Lagos. Um, and I just remember thinking, wait, why not FK? I just, I, it was just a really random thought because yeah. we were friends. We had a very similar sense of humor. Every time we were around each other, hung around, like the vibes were immaculate. So I just sent her a text being like, I still have this on my phone. It was a WhatsApp. Hmm. You, we, we do NFT with it. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I sent her a WhatsApp. She was like, oh, that sounds cool. Then she spoke to her cousin who used to work at Spinlet at the time, actually. No, I worked at Spinlet. Yes, I know. So we came to the office. Can't you remember? I don't yeah, think you remember. I don't, I don't remember that. No, but it was ages ago. Like, we came to the office. Um, so it was going to be either Spinlet or, or Aristocrats or Midas Radio at the time, Midas was more keen. Mm. It, more keen meant that they just moved faster. Spinless yeah. wanted to do it as well. Um, because Faye came and I didn't want to produce the podcast on our own. Um, and it, it moved in a matter of like weeks. It was very fast. And the agreement was we'll do like, depending on how the first episode goes, we'll know whether we'll make this a real thing or not. Like we just didn't think of much. So we did a logo. Somebody did logo. It wasn't really a lot of thought. Yeah. But I knew what I wanted was to do something that was smart but primarily didn't take itself too seriously. It didn't mean it was fundamentally unserious, yeah. but it didn't take itself so too seriously. So something that essentially reflects you as a person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so kind of now going into the kind of things we're going to be talking about yeah, today. Sure. Um, I imagine your podcast has a lot of young listeners. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think the vibe is currently amongst young people generally and I guess some of your listeners have any of them kind of like expressed voter apathy or just apathy oh. to do with the country in general. In general. So um I mean not to brag or anything. No, no. <laughs> we have a a global audience, which is strange to me, but then again, Nigerians move everywhere. So we have an audience that is pushed by the Nigerian diaspora abroad. Yeah. Um but it's mostly like people of black descent, African descent across the world. What's interesting is that apathy is not just 
um, apathy of any kind is not just unique to Nigeria. It's actually mm. a global issue at the moment. People have a lot that they feel really wary about, particularly as it concerns the political space. Yeah. It seems like almost every country is going crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So young people are very, very irritated with leadership. Because I think for a very long time, we were under, and this is pre-social media, we were under the impression that people in government had a sense of what they were doing globally. Not Nigeria. We've never had that. <laughs> we've never been under that illusion. But I think globally, there was this sense that like, you know, particularly, I'll talk about what I'm mostly exposed to, which is very Western. So the Amer- it always felt like the American and British government, if nobody knows what they are doing, those, ones, those guys yeah. know what yeah. they are doing. But in the last, I would say, particularly in the last five years, like half a decade. Seems like the Trump era. Yes. It, just before the Just Trump before era. the Trump era. There's yeah. been this sense that like, okay, not only do these guys not know what they're doing, there seems to be a lack of interest in actually getting work done. And will we have a future? Like, mm-hmm. you, I think that's just like a sense I get across like young people in general. Now, Nigerians in particular, we've always had this thing where for some reason, we've usually, we're usually quite optimistic. So this go better so type go of mentality. Better. But in the last, particularly like, you know, seven, eight years, it's been really bad. People just don't get the sense. If anything, it's the opposite. We have this sense that don't worry, you can still get worse. <laughs> oh, don't you worry. Like, you think it's bad now? Oh, man. And I think that is pushing people to feel helpless, mm. you know. Um, and we don't have a lot of like David and Goliath type stories here, right? The small guy doesn't win in Nigeria. That's not a typical story. Yeah. Truth, justice, honesty, and the little guy winning is not a story yeah. that we're familiar with. So I think that it's not necessarily voter apathy. It's just this lackluster attitude. Like, life is really, really trash. Like, I don't see the point of much. Mm. Um, the point of getting invested in who is leading me or my job. It just doesn't... A lot of people just feel like, what really is the point? Yeah. I think that's what I'm seeing. It's not specific to voter apathy. It's just a meh attitude mm. in general. Okay, so that's interesting. And I'm going to tie that into NSARS, mm. right? And the movement and I guess the general feeling that came during the movement mm. and right after the movement. Mm-hmm. I think it awakened stuff in a lot of people, mm-hmm, galvanized mm-hmm. people. People were really gingered. Mm-hmm. Um, so as on the one hand, you're seeing apathy. Mm. Do you think that that energy that was very present and very real during the NSAS movement. Mm-hmm. I mean, it died down a bit after. Oh, yeah. But I think with the whole PVC drives that, are, oh, yeah. that people are doing, I mm-hmm. think that energy and momentum has come back up a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that that can be sustained and will impact the 2023 elections positively? Oh, yeah, for sure. So I think during and right after answers, there was this idea, because I think that was the first time our generation had ever done sort of like nationwide protests. So when my parents were in university, you know, they were like, ah, this was normal. This was normal normal this level. Normal. Yeah, this is, you know, my, dad would, my mom and dad would always say that any, like, if, you know, and you know, there were lots of like coups, counter coups and stuff like that. But there was a, there was a, because there wasn't social media at the time, you'd get your news through radio and TV and there was a concerted effort to suppress that because they knew the students would rock off. Like, they, there was no, yeah. no two ways about it. Those guys, you know, they would try and keep them really contained. And because we had a campus culture, m- most uni students were on campus. So the next thing you know, they close school gates, mm-hmm. trying to kind of keep them in. But I think NSAS was the first time our generation had really ever been directly involved in that kind of wide, um, nationwide, wide-scale, very focused on hunding. Um, protest, focusing on one thing. Um, I do think it's definitely going to have a massive impact. Young Nigerians are very, very, very adamantine. If they let it not be like I didn't try, I think is, a, is an attitude mm. that I'm seeing. Mm. Um, even with people that I... So I remember like um, talking to my assistant and she was like, oh yeah, she went to one place, said she couldn't do it there. She went back to her family house in Festac. Yeah. And she's not really, I wouldn't say she's someone who's like super politically active or, but she was like, no, this one. And she's turning 21. Okay. So she was like, oh, this one, she's going to do it. And I've, I've, yeah, I've gotten that attitude from lots of just people that I, because I like to bring up conversations with anybody. So if I'm in an Uber, I go to the salon, I go to do my, I just, and there's an attitude of, 
oh no, that PVC, you won't frustrate me. Mm. I will collect it, which is really, really cool. I think um, people are frustrated and they do feel a sense of helplessness, but it does feel like if there's one thing I can do, because sometimes I feel like when you're shouting, you're just shouting into the abyss and complaining on social media. But if there's one thing I can actively do, it's kind of get my voter's card. And it's not as dire as... I think the projections of how dire it is are a reflection of who wants it to be dire as mm. opposed to the reality. A yeah. lot of people are trying yeah. to get those PVCs. A lo- like a lot more than people think. Even within that, there's still um, some sort of like, is it really going to do anything? So there are people that will say stuff like, me, I've registered, Sha. <laughs> but I don't know. Exactly. You know, that kind of attitude. Yeah. But there's still, there's something behind that. And I'm trying to hold on to that as some sort of comfort. So yeah, I do think that momentum is sustained. The only thing is, we're not as good as at organizing as we think. Mm. And that's the core of it, right? Mm. Like, organizing is a big, big thing. Yeah. It's not just about the feeling yeah. and harnessing that feeling. Yeah. It's the machinery underneath the feeling. And you I was going to ask that as really well. Like how, how do we, or how do you think we can move the needle from talking and agitating to actual action? Um, the first thing is that organizing is actually work. So I know that for a lot of Nigerians, the idea of an NGO has been bastardized. She's doing NGO. He's for doing sure. NGO. They are doing NGO. But um, the role of like community-based organizations, non-government organizations, civil justice organizations, um, which has been highly politicized here, is to do some of that work. Now, the issue is who is going to build the cats, who is actually going to do that work on a very like base level, right? I think, and that's what the key is. So everybody wants to do something mm-hmm. in theory. Like if you talk to people, people are down. That's the truth. People are legit down. But the problem is, okay, who is, or what organizations are, Nigerians are also quite realistic, I've noticed, in that, they're not looking for sins per se. Yeah. They just don't want anyone to waste their time. So, you know, my mom always used the word non-compromised or uncompromised. Sort of like organizations who are legitimately agitating for very direct causes or issues that people care about. Not as a means to an end. Not because the founder wants to go and do masters abroad <laughs> or, yeah. or because, you know, you're trying to get into the room with leaders or you want to eventually use it to leverage into yeah you know some sort of political position but people who know what it takes to and what does agitation mean it means at a base level a very understanding a very good understanding of what the current um landscape is so i'll give you an example you're agitating you're trying to figure out police reform you understand exactly what is like i just say on ground on ground what is on ground you understand what's you know is what um, the legal framework is, and then you have a very clear end goal. Mm. And all you are focused on is that. Um, but what tends to happen is people have seen one too many times, you know, you back or you believe in or you strongly support um, an NGO or a, you know, civil justice organization. And then before you know it, it's like that organization has now become XYZ support group. A tool for yeah, something. Or, yeah. you know, the NGO is now kind of like, they only exist on socials because the founder has gone to Yale mm-hmm. on the back of that. You and know, that just stuff like that. And you know what Nigerians hate? They hate being taken for mugs. Yeah. They Got hate mugs, it. A photo op than they, the actual work. The average Nigerian really hates feeling like a fool. Yeah. So once that comes in, people get really, they get irritated to the max and that means they dismiss all the other stuff. They don't even want to hear it, yeah. you know. And I guess that then leads to apathy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just because um, you pin so much of your hope on that because if your government is not trustworthy, more and more people are falling out of love with religious institutions. When that kind of breaks your heart as well, you're like, eh, mm. I'm not really interested. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's, this kind of thing is also where I guess influencer advocacy can mm-hmm. play a role, play a part. Mm. What are your general thoughts on influencer advocacy? And do you think more people or more influencers should take up the 
mantle of advocacy? Um, well, yes, for sure. But here's what I think. I, I think it would be nice if people were not under pressure to use their platforms as a, you know, just like a general market mm-hmm. for all sorts of advocacy. Some people genuinely have that sort of passion yeah. and interest. And some people don't. What I think would be better is to kind of encourage, not push, there's a difference. Mm. Encourage people to talk about the things they genuinely care about. Things that matter to them. That things that matter to them. It doesn't make your advocacy of less worth if you are not constantly agitating for something or the other. Mm. I think, you know, again, because there are very few true leaders in Nigeria, um, I have a whole tangent about how, like, I, I, you can tell I'm a pastor's child with what I'm about to say, <laughs> but I feel like, feel like idolatry is innate to human beings. We want to look up to something, mm. right? So whether that's, like, you know, a deity, if you're, you know, religious, or it's why people hold very strongly to, like, mentors, and people get very disappointed when their favorite artist or favorite actress or yeah. favorite personality does something they fundamentally it's disagree with. Thing. You know, cancel culture comes from that. It's like, how could you do that? Um, and I think that influencers might worry about that so much that it begins to push them to talk about stuff they don't really care about or they don't have an avid interest in because they don't want to seem like bad people. Yeah. But I do think it's important to talk about what you care about. One of my favorites, and it's kind of surprising because I didn't follow, but Tatcha yeah. from Big Brother, yes. she's on it. She's really in there. She's in there, but she's but it's her personality yes. and it's what she cares about. But there are other people who you find care about smaller individual things. Like some people really are focused on, you know, younger people getting an education or sort of like anti-cultism mm. or domestic violence. Or some people care about animals and the environment and stuff like that. I think it's really important that just because we have a dearth in society, Nigerian society, of people who we are meant to look up to. So like, you know, political leaders and social justice warriors and religious leaders are people you are meant to look up to. And it is a constant disappointment. Yeah, We kind of move all of that to people that we... I'm more familiar with. Mm. And there's this constant barrage of, you are not saying, talking about this. You're not talking about that. How can I talk about this? And the way you spoke about this is not good. Exactly. And, and then people get really, really agitated and really worried about saying the exact correct thing about every single and thing. And there is no exact correct no, thing about isn't. every single thing. Exactly. So yeah. I think it's really important. Um, but it's making, pe- making it clear that it's actually about the cause and not the individual. Mm. you know, the cause isn't tarnished because someone isn't talking about it or someone isn't talking about it correctly. Yeah. Or, the, or in the way you think, or in the way you think they should it. or how often you think they should. I think it's more important to make, um, create an environment where people are not too anxious that they end up saying like nothing at all. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So let me go back to the, um, feeling that I mentioned mm. during the NSARS movement and whatever, I, I feel like a lot of it was down to um, the contributions and what FEMCO did at the time in terms of people seeing a little ecosystem that basically sprung up overnight mm. that had structure and it was functioning as its own little community, mm. you know, and I think that gave a lot of people hope. And I think that in itself was a form of activism from mm. you guys. Um, are there any other projects you might be working on at the moment, activism wise or anything? Yes, please were paying school fees. Hey. <laughs> oh my God. You see, oh. <laughs> um, so Femco actually. Our core focus has always been sort of like women's, like education, safety, and like 
empowerment. Yes, yes. Well, like more financial and political. Yeah. But at the moment, our main our main focus is um education. So we have a bunch of fem them. Mm-hmm. Some young girls who we are putting through um, school. There's 12 of them in our first batch. And we put them in a private school, a really, really good private school. And uh, hmm, it is very expensive. Um, and and I, so that, that's kind of what we're focused on. That's our first batch of stuff we're focused on. It's really getting um, a bunch of young women through education. And these were girls who really wouldn't have had that opportunity. Yeah. Otherwise, um, and designing what that program looks like. So um, they finished their first year last week, which was very exciting. Um, but we are going to be going through with that for the next 12 years because the hope is for all of them to go through university. Okay. And as it stands, we're doing it every other year. So we don't have the bandwidth to take on students every single year. Correct. In 2024, we're going to have a new batch as well. So there'll be some girls in GS3 and some in GS1. Um, and yeah, that's our main project. Um, and we need it's a lot of work because it's not just, if it was just the fees, it would be one thing, but there's also like, like a lot of emotional support. And I forgot what it's like to be a teenager mm. um, as well. And like keeping their spirits up and encouraging them and making sure like, yeah, well-rounded. Exactly. It's not just about the academic education yeah. they are receiving. Um, so if you ever get like, you know, an email from Femco talking about fees, it's not fake. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fake. We're working on that. And then we've also started some other projects. But we have smaller projects that we do and individual projects that we do. Yeah. Um, working with um, women from lower income backgrounds to kind of bolster income. And things like that. So we do that. And then we also partner with organizations that are already set. So we're not trying to do it be a be all and end all. Yeah. Um, so if collaboration. We, yes, very, very important to us because I think people think of Femco in a very like lofty way, post mm. NSARS, but it's literally literally for team babes using like software. Yeah. Really. Um, some of it very, very basic software. Um so yeah, that's kind of what we're focused on at the moment. It's a lot, of, lot more education, education and financial empowerment schemes. Those are the main things we're talking about. And we need like a lot of support. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So I think Femco is a good segue into the next thing I want to ask mm-hmm. you about women in politics in Nigeria. Weep. <laughs> <laughs> Weep. WIP Why do Nigerians or w- like w- all w- the e- things? Mwah. Whip. <laughs> um, yeah, so what are your... I guess, what are your thoughts on the current landscape mm. of women in politics in Nigeria? I mean, mm-hmm. against also the backdrop of... I know there's this gender bill that was just rejected. Um, gender equality bill that was just rejected. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts generally about mm. the landscape as it is today? I'm, how do you think or what do you think it should be? Mm. Or how do you think Nigeria would look if there was proper representation, you know, of women in politics? In politics in well, Nigeria? as a member of FEMCO, <laughs> um, you will like, it doesn't take, if you know me at all, you know, I have very, very strong feelings on women's capacity and our ability and what we can do and the opportunities were allowed. Yeah. Now, the current landscape is really not surprising at all when you think about our society in general and how, what we think women ought to do, like what their primary roles are. Mm. Leadership is not one of them. Mm. So it's, it's, if you calm down and you think about it from that level, nothing about the way the country is structured is very surprising. It's surprising, yeah. Um, I've been <clears throat> in very close quarters with female politicians. And I... I've seen firsthand what the ideas on the type of person they are supposed to be and what their priorities ought to be are. Um, and how they often need to navigate this space. So let me give you a typical example, right? We get very, very annoyed at um, the current women in House of Reps and Senate. Some of it is rightly deserved. Mm. They are on some bullshit. Mm. 
mm-hmm. like a lot of the time. But a lot of it is irrational. And I'll explain what I mean. I think there are like 11 women. You said? In Senate. No, uh, it's not 11. Come on. <laughs> I, think, I think altogether it's like seven and four. It's something ridiculous. They're not up to 20 women in both houses, in our legislative office. And they're like 300 and something altogether. Mm. Pretty ridiculous. So now when we say, <clears throat> you know, they should be passing bills. Bills are a collaborative effort. Yeah. So you can create the most like hardcore, revolutionary women's rights bill. It can be majestic in nature. Like you've gotten some of the most brilliant legal minds to work with you. You've done all the research. You've worked with, you know, civil society groups. You've, you know, looked at what's going on in countries that are very forward thinking about women. And you've created this fantastic thing. Then you take it to the floor. It doesn't matter how fantastic that bill is. If your colleagues think this is nonsense, women should be in the kitchen barefoot. <laughs> Their primary duty is to reproduce. Yeah. I didn't see. The other room. Yeah. So it is just never going to happen. And a big part of being a politician in Nigeria is not driven by impact. You are not a, a good politician in, in Nigeria is not someone who moves the needle forward or is making people's lives better. Yeah. A new pol- a good politician in Nigeria is someone who knows how to politic. Hmm. And to be a good politician as it stands means you have to be liked primarily by your colleagues. It's really not about the impression people have of you. Yeah. It's about maintaining your position. And it's a global phenomenon, right? You see that even in Western politics, there's a lot of stuff about like, you know, there's a lot of grandstanding and remaining chummy with the group. Yeah. And women who get into that um, can get caught up in that and they don't have enough support. Mm-hmm. You know, even shamefully, I can't even remember a lot of their names. So all this talk of like the kind of women you support in politics or women who should be in politics and what should be happening the groundswell of support is going to come from us. The thing is also when they get into office, it's very disappointing most of the time in how forgettable you are, mm. right? Like, you know, you get into office and, you know, you're not really doing with your, with your personal, with the money that you get as a politician, with the funds allocated to you, the way you design community projects, constituency projects, there's nothing that really shows you are genuinely invested in women's healthcare or their lives or their education. So you are pretty much one of the boys. Hmm. But you are not also one of the boys at the same time. So, you know, I, 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 I think the landscape as it is is really a reflection of Nigerian society because it's not like it's that much better in entertainment where I am yeah. in, at a leadership position. Not really. Everybody's going to say, Mo'abudu, Mo'abudu, Mo'abudu. Calm down. She's not the, like, you know, after Mo, yeah. she love. Like, look at top 10 charts in music. Look at the execs in music. Look at the execs in film. Look at the, you know, it, it's not... It's, it's not a politics problem. Yeah, it's not a politics problem. I mean, my dad used to work in finance. There was a whole hullabaloo when I think there were four female bank MDs. It became like a big, you know, there were covers and a lot of talk about that but there's well, like how many banks mm. you know it's not a politics problem it's a societal problem the ideal would again also stem from society a more egalitarian society means that it's not a fuss for women to be in political office to mm. hold higher office it means you're not having conversations about who is taking care of their children or how their children turn out because, yeah. you know, they are working these kinds of jobs or them being emotional when they are putting forward certain types of bills or just... Or oh, God forbid she earns more than her husband. Yes, and you know, <laughs> there's all this chat about, you know, they do meetings in the night. Mm-hmm. How will she ever make it to a meeting in the night? You know, just... It's... I, I don't want to, like, kind of pontificate about possibilities without thinking of the reality. I am very, very disheartened by the way our society treats education 
and knowledge and being smart, mm. particularly with young people and children. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean. At the moment, there are a few cool things you can be. You can be a musician. That's really popping at the moment. Or mm. a producer. You can be an influencer or YouTuber. You can work in tech. Those are the really like cool things. Podcaster. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not, there's nothing banging about being clever. Nothing. Nigeria doesn't make a kid want to be smart. Mm. You want to be funny. You want to be, you know, talented in entertainment. But you don't want to be smart. And it's something that bugs me. Um, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. So I'm trying to figure out how to design a program or a bunch of programs in different um, facets of life that make it really, really important and really cool and really special to be a smart kid. Um, let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say at the moment you're a 12-year-old and you're just really, really good at biology, chemistry, and physics. Or, and just in general, like you're really, really smart. It doesn't do anything for you. Nobody gives a shit. Um, there are no competitions for that. There is no, there are no accolades. But yeah, 10, 11, 12, and you are very animated in performing Buga. Mm -hmm. You're going to go viral yeah. on Instagram. And people are going to ask your parents for their account details. And it's going to be really cool. And people are going to want to see what you do. Hmm. But th there's just no incentive in this country to be clever. And it is absolute rubbish. Like, we don't treat... Smart kids are considered annoying. They are apropos. What are you even going to do with that one? Um, and nobody rewards it. Yeah, and even if you think about it, even when they do have competitions and somebody wins, maybe the 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 first prize is a book. Okay, let me give let me give a few people expo. So if you're a bank and you're listening to me, or you're a telco and you're listening to me, I know it's really attractive to do those music and dancing and singing competitions. Um, but you're rich enough to do more. So. I have never, I'm 30 years old, and I have never seen any financial institution, and I'll pick on finance because my dad used to work in finance, say, look, okay, we are the Nigerian banking. I don't know what their group is called. Shall they have their own group. Mm, let's call them Guild. The Guild <laughs> Bankers Association. Uh -huh. You know, so Nigeria has how many universities? You can say every year, the top the top 10 from the top 10 universities. So the number one at like, you know, Babcock, OAU, you know, Redeemers, Unilag, Uniben, UI. If you are, you know, the best in accounting, you are the best in finance, you are the best in economics. Um, in your final year, what we're going to do is between the 10 of you, there are how many banks and the banks, the central banks, everybody joined together. At the end of that, you are guaranteed a job somewhere. It's guaranteed. Mm. And apart from that, we'll give you money. Nigerians are moved by money. People are not doing multinational dance hall because they want to bond as a family. Okay, that cash is sweet. It's sweet. It is delicious. Give each of you 5M, that's 50M, people can afford it. And you are guaranteed a job. Now, what that means is automatically, you guys at the banks are getting the best brains in the country from those institutions. And you're incentivizing kids to work hard. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? But we don't do that, right? You know, telecoms guys are not like, okay, who are the top 10 engineers from your department? They're guaranteed a job with us and a sign-on bonus of 5M. Nobody does that because it's not cool to be smart in Nigeria. There's no reward. And it makes sense because illiterates in House of Reps, illiterates in Senate, illiterates in Asorok. Just like we don't incentivize someone who is smart to want to do and be more. And it's really, really sad because on a national level, it means people think applying themselves to those things are a waste of time. So think of things like sickle cell. Nigeria is one of the countries with the highest rates, but none of our universities are really doing any research 
on that because it's 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 better for you to just download footy loops and learn to make beats quite frankly like mm. it, a country that doesn't incentivize that does that in different ways there's, there's stuff my mom used on me when I was a baby it's herbs it's agbo what's inside she doesn't know mm. and she's probably going to give me when I have children what is this I don't know but if, if you rub it, it on your baby's back it doesn't have rashes anymore but nobody has been incentivized to patent that stuff and do five or six or seven years of research to make it happen yeah. do you see what I mean so that's the one if I would change anything I think education I know what education did in my family I'll use my family as a very, you know, between my grandfather and me, yo, there's such a world of difference. And that's because in the middle, Awalawa said, okay, you're from the Southwest, you're going to school for free. And I know what that did for my dad. Um, and that changed our lives. So I really would, that would be the only thing I would care about because it has a spill on effect to everything else. But just the way we value and we treat education would change completely. All right. And I think um, on that note, we can end the session. I don't even think I have much to say. <laughs> um, make smartness cool again. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> make smartness cool again. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Jola. Thank you for having me. This was actually a very rewarding conversation. Oh. Please, I'm not going to be nice to you about this again. <laughs> Just collect this one. Ah, yeah. I think my dad would be happy. Say, hey, not that one you people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys. We are out. Bye.